Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Real pleasure to be here at the IWA Development Congress. Two years in the planning, despite some of the challenges, we are here in Colombo. So welcome to this second keynote address for the day. The title of today's session is Resource Recovery and Reuse Business Models. My name is Hamant Kassan. I come from South Africa, from a water utility called Rain Water. I also serve on the board of the International Water Association and the African Water Association. I'd like to introduce you to your keynote speaker today. His name is Pei Drischel. He holds a PhD in environmental sciences and is a principal researcher and research program leader at the International Water Management Institute commonly known as IMI, headquartered in Colombo, here in Sri Lanka. He has over 25 years worth of professional experience. I can assure you, when I introduce you to your panel later, that the combined experience of your panel is nothing less than some 100 years. But you will notice that as I introduce each one of them. So we have almost three decades of experience from pay, He's been working extensively in the rural-urban interface of developing countries, coordinating projects and programs on the safe recovery of water, nutrients, and organic matter from domestic waste streams with a special interest in safe wastewater irrigation, urban and peri-urban agriculture, and the cutting edge of applied interdisciplinary research on business solutions. Pei supervised a large number of graduate and postgraduate students, served on a range of different technical and scientific advisory committees, contributed to successful proposal of over 50 million US dollars, I might say, and leads currently a program with an annual budget of 3 million US dollars. He has authored over 350 publications, half in peer peer-reviewed books and journals, and has worked extensively in West and East Africa and Southeast Asia. For those of you that, that were here yesterday evening for the award ceremony, I should mention that your keynote speaker today was the recipient of the research award of this very same Congress in Jordan four years ago. I'd like to welcome this esteemed speaker to allow him to provide us with a fascinating presentation. Please welcome him in the IWA way. Thank you. So I hope this works, the technique. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to the International Water Association for inviting me here. It was a lot of credit which I just got and Thanks a lot for this. There's one credit I don't want to accept, and that's the credit for this long title there. I have no idea who, who actually put this title together. Twice the same word, rural and actually had to Google the title. I Googled remote business models. That means working from home. Actually, it's what I would like to do now. Um, but Apparently, I'm here at the very wrong place for, for realizing this. Uh, anyway, then I thought probably at IWA there was a task force under the leadership of Carlos thinking very long what kind of title could we give this guy. And I want to respect this. So I just accept the title. Done. Done deal. And actually, I'm accepting it also because it's so, so typical for what we call resource recovery and reuse, because for all of those who work on resource recovery and reuse, we quickly realize these are two different types of shoes. There's the resource recovery part, many of us feel very comfortable with this, and then there's the reuse part. And the reuse part, that's what, where the challenges start. The reuse part is the one which asks us to link sectors to bring the waste management, the sanitation together, for instance, with the agricultural sector. It's not actually our shoes, it's the agricultural sector. And it's asking us to cross 
administrative boundaries. You go out in the rural area where we are the urban sanitation scientists. And most of all, challenging our disciplinary comfort zone because, hey, let me just give you an example here from Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka, the government invested heavily in compost stations. So we have more than 100 compost stations in Sri Lanka. We probably could be world champion in composting municipal solid waste. And these stations are working very well, so they're producing a lot of compost, but unfortunately the capacity to understand the agricultural sector, to understand the demand, what kind of quality, when, how much, this type of marketing which is needed, the business thinking behind, this is missing. So there's a lot of production, very little which gets actually sold. So that is this moving out of our comfort zone, that is what makes the source recovery and reuse very interesting. And that's what we tried in our team at the International Water Management Institute, breaking boundaries, <coughs> building bridges between the sectors, between the disciplines. And building bridges is also what is needed if we want to tackle the big water challenges our cities are facing. Urban water demand will increase by 80% to 2050. And you see on the slide all the different sectors which will struggle for the water, the energy sector, industrial sector, of course urban water supply and sanitation. But most of the water is in agriculture. The agriculture sector again, Chennai has 14,000 tankers which are going out. And I like this cartoon very much. There's a city coming! Sorry if I wrote anyway. Um, there's a city coming. Yeah, that's just like it. I guess. This, of course, shows us that it's a crisis is tackled just by informal markets. There will be a lot of conflicts, and we have to avoid these conflicts, and we have to move over to something which is a planned approach. In a planned approach is nothing else than a business model. There's an urban area which has a lot of demand, and there's a rural area which is a the area which is providing the water. In an ideal world, it would be all very easy. The rural farmers can spare some of the water, and it's not much. So they give maybe 10% to the city. 
from the sitting 10% of what Sir Hubert Palmer's hair is quite a lot. This would be a fantastic, easy situation, but unfortunately, usually both sectors are struggling, and it's not so easy. And about 40% of the largest cities are vulnerable to water deficits because they are competing with crop irrigation. And now the good news. 10% improvement in the irrigation efficiency could actually solve this crisis for approximately 80% of those cities which are in a high conflict zone, in high conflict watersheds. So increasing water use efficiency, and this can be your better crop varieties, this can be better irrigation system, this can be just that you know when to apply the water at the right time and at the right space. Such improvements of stopping leakages can help the cities to overcome the water crisis. That's quite an interesting message because as a city we would think about what can we do in investing in the city. But maybe the call is to invest in the rural area, to invest and help agriculture to become more efficient and then we can already address some of these problems. Um, actually, the same was done in, in Cape Town. So in Cape Town, the larger farmers, the larger farmers observed the situation. They knew that water is coming to an end. So they planned already. They put a lot behind the dams. And then we were approaching day zero. They released some 10 million cubic meters of water for the city. But that's also one off. Could you make a contract? A colleague of mine, Winston Yu, had to make a very comprehensive, very interesting rescue of hundreds of such projects where water is reallocated from rural areas to urban areas. And as you see, the literature only peaked in the last years. One of the interesting findings was that when you look at the attributions of this reallocation, there's very often very limited information available, like conflict resolution. Conflict resolution when the donor area might say, sorry, you're taking too much. Or increasingly, what do we do if we just take the water and they need the water, so with what are we replacing it? In general, what kind of compensation schemes are there so that these contracts can work? It's a very interesting review, and it's even more important because in 20% of these high conflict basins, a 10% improvement of irrigation water efficiency would not help. So we have to look for other means, we have to look for desalination, we have to look for whatever is possible. And one interesting part, and I'm coming now back to the resource recovery and reuse, is the water swap. It's a swap between fresh water and wastewater. And this might look very theoretical. So there's a city, the city is producing a lot of wastewater, is making it available after very nice treatment to the farmers, and the farmers are making it available fresh water. Looks theoretical? No, it exists. In many cases. Like for instance, take Mashhad, Mashhad Iran. Many, many visitors. This city permanently in a water crisis. So when you go to Iran, every second hotel is in Mashhad. So many visitors. It's a very important political city. And in Mashhad in 2006, the farmers started to release annually about 21 million cubic meters of fresh water from two dams. In exchange, they got from the city 25 million cubic meters of treated wastewater. So there were fixed contracts between the regional water association and the farmer groups, the water rights holders. And in addition, they discussed if they also can take the groundwater rights of the farmers. The challenge here of this continuous exchange the farmers handed over the water rights and received the wastewater so the farmers didn't get the wastewater quality they were expecting. So when they signed the contracts, they were told, 
the waters of very good quality. But then the treated wastewater was mixed again with other surface water and other wastewater which was untreated and farmers were not happy with what they received. There was also no training provided for farmers to deal with the water of lower quality. So this shows us there are options but also there are challenges. Barcelona, another very interesting case. Barcelona, it was in 2007-2008, a very long draw. It was a draw which, for which the city paid dearly. The reason that an economic loss of 1.6 billion. They were not prepared, but of course after this they started thinking and they invested in, in long distance water transfer. They invested in um, salt removal. They invested in the water swap. So they are providing, they have the facility, they upgraded their treatment facilities and they can provide now farmers 20 million cubic meters of high quality, soil free, treated wastewater in case of the last big draw. So here it's not a continuous exchange, but an exchange on demand. As long as there's enough water, the farmers don't want to give their water away. As long as there's enough water, the city doesn't need it. But in case of a draw, they can go and they can make the swap with the farmers. It's very interesting. When we look normally, these photos which we see a lot, they, the poor, they represent the face of day zero. But the numbers behind, that's in the economy. And these waters first class cities, they represent 4.8 trillion of dollars economic activity. That means sometimes these investments in climate change adaptation, they might look costly. And in Spain, for instance, for instance, the operator maintenance cost of this extra treatment facility that are three to five million per year. So an auditor would just say, hey, you don't swap any water, but still you pay every year three to million. Um, this doesn't look good. No, it looks good. There comes one big fraud again, and this investment, that is an insurance, this investment um, will show that it worked out. Mexico City. Mexico City, very high altitude. It's not a water swap. Mexico City, like other cities, think, why should I actually swap water if I can use my own water? We are using just our own wastewater, and I don't want to bring you these examples, which everyone knows from Singapore. Media. So Mexico City excessively replenished the aquifer in the Tula Valley, in the Mesquita Valley, with its wastewater. So the aquifer boosting, full. And the quality was not bad. So the plans are to recover from the aquifer approximately 160 to 190 million cubic meters. Because other alternatives are increasingly available. Yeah, there are many more projects which are trying from far away to get water to Mexico City, but it's not the distance, it's the attitude. Yeah, pumping up, that's the cost structure. And getting it from the Tula Valley um, is quite a cheaper option. And it makes the city its own downstream user. And it's not only that the city is using its own downstream water, once this has been realized. Um, it's also that there are 90,000 hectares of wastewater irrigation, which are also producing for the city. So there are many different routes, and Mexico has yeah, yeah. certainly a very interesting situation in terms of managing the risk with this. Last example, and then I'm done. Bangalore, another city which becomes its own downstream user. So Bangalore, the, the city of all the beautiful lakes, no, the city of all the polluted lakes. No, the city of the Don Lake. Uh, it becomes a bit difficult. Um, but Bangalore started directing. It's treated, treated wastewater to right up reservoirs, tanks in its vicinity, refilling the local aquifers. The local people were very, very happy, but of course they came out to the private tankers then again and brought it back to, to Bangalore. An extension to 38 lakes has been discussed would provide Bangalore with uh, 180 million liters per day extra water. So the city again becoming its own downstream user, of course recovery. 
of course, controlling the informal water market, controlling water quality is, like in all these situations, very, very important. And I think the slide speaks for itself. Um, you don't know what you get and from where they say get the water and find the water. Conclusion. Improvements in agricultural water use efficiency can sometimes be a really something you should look at. And if you need an institute which understands the irrigation and irrigation agricultural use efficiency, um, the International Water Management Institute might be a good address for you to go. Resource recovery via the freshwater wastewater slot offers more options which can help both sectors. This in its concept, however, depends strongly on the incentives which can be provided to the farmer that they have to give the water rights to the city, the ranch and how much, and the ability of the city to provide high quality water. The success of such a slot can of course be jeopardized by negative perception, unclear contractual responsibility, or uncontrolled informal water market. The challenge for understanding these water slots, the reallocation for our scientists is still that there are very limited data available, the cost and impact, the performance of these slots. I'd like to thank First of all, my colleague Miriam Otto, um, who was in the core team, helped us to write, for instance, this book which I'm showing here, which is free online. And if you need any copies, just give me your card. You also have some copies at our booth. And I'd like to thank IWA. And I'd like to thank those papers from which I was drawing some of the big data. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for that inspiring presentation, quickly sharing some amazing case studies from across the world. I'd like to now move on to introduce you to each of our panel members that come from different parts of the world. The first gentleman is uh, Mr. Jay Bhagwan. He is from South Africa. He is the executive manager of the key strategic area of water use and waste management at the South African Water Research Commission, which focuses on the management of water and wastewater in domestic mining and industrial sectors. He held the post of the president of the Water Institute of South Africa, chairperson of the Minister of Water Affairs and Forestry Water Advisory Committee, as well as the international advisory position with the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council, the IWA Global Development Agency, and UNEP. He continues to be actively involved in a broad range of areas in the field of water supply, wastewater, and sanitation, with current focus being on sanitation technologies for the future. Technology innovation and application, social franchising of operations and maintenance, conduit, hydropower, benchmarking, reuse and reclamation of effluent. He's been instrumental in contributing to the development of the IWA. He's also currently the chair of the newly established IWA specialist group on non sewage sanitation. Welcome, Mr. Jay Bhagwan. We are looking forward to your participation and your wisdom on this panel. The next person I'd like to introduce is a lady. We are also very gender sensitive in this association. So I'd like to introduce Mona, who currently heads the Faculty of Planning at CEPC University in India and is principal investigator for Fit for Purpose Integrative Water Use Project between India and the Netherlands as a team member of the Center for Water and Sanitation at CEPC University. She has in excess of two decades of experience in teaching, research, training, and consulting clean water, sanitation, and waste management sectors with focus on policy initiatives, urban planning, and project development, mainly in Asia and the Pacific. Welcome, Mona. Please join the panel. We have South Africa, we have India, we have Colombo, and we will move on further to our next lady, Jennifer Williams is the 
the executive director of the newly formed Fecal Sludge Management Alliance. The mission of the Fecal Sludge Management Alliance is to provide safely managed sanitation primarily through FSM with focus on reuse and recovery. Prior to this role, she spent seven years at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, working on their water sanitation and hygiene team in various capacities. Jennifer's background is political science and sociology. Welcome, Jennifer. We are looking forward to your contribution. The last member of our panel is Dr. Vera, who is currently serving as a project director under the State Ministry of Water Supply Facilities to put up a state-of-the-art advanced technological laboratory worth 15 million US dollars. He works very actively in the research field on investigating groundwater pollution and developing uh, treatment technologies. In addition, he serves as the team leader of Water Safety Plan Advisory Unit under the purview of World Health Organization. He has secured over 50 journal and conference papers as well as received many, many awards. Welcome, Dr. Vera. Now, esteemed ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the presentation, you have seen the case studies. May I perhaps present you with two minutes each to comment and add further value or inform us of other case studies, etc. Please share your wisdom. I'll start with Mr. J. Bhagwan. Let me share uh, the context of South Africa, where 50 years ago we had demonstrated uh, the reality of various and uh, is a good example. And uh, at that time, the short-sightedness was that it was a very expensive exercise. Uh, if we had invested in that space today, we would have been much well off around how we were managing the water uh, in, in this current challenge around climate, around drought, etc. So like my CEO always says that, uh, you know, this is a man-made problem. Uh, you know, managing drought or having droughts is a man-made problem. All the technology and the uh, opportunities we have, we've never leapfrogged any of these innovations at the time that we needed to do. So we added a new recovery, and that's the one uh, we, we use a lot around regeneration, okay? Because regenerating the value chain is where our Achilles heel is, you know, around issues around uh, acceptance, issues around tariffing, uh, issues around uh, uh, management capacity, and having the right skills to fill in that space. So if we're able to bring in the element of regeneration to resource and recovery, right across all the sectors, we're able to, at this time and age, leapfrog a lot of those opportunities that, that are sitting there from a technical perspective. Thank you very much. Mona? Uh, well, I think I would like to share my experiences with India, about India and wastewater reuse. Uh, not particularly with reference to any case study, but if I look at what Pei was discussing about the water swap, urban-rural water swap, and if we look at it from the perspective of resource recovery, there are mainly uh, two kinds of water swaps that we see in India. One is for the fresh water, uh, which is either purchased, the surface fresh water, which is purchased, or the groundwater through private water markets. And when we look at that swap, there is a business model there. But in this conversation, we are focusing more on the wastewater. And if you look at the wastewater swap between the urban and the rural areas, I would like to classify the cities in India into th three categories. And there are 10 million plus cities, which, or around 10 million cities, population cities, which uh, have a lot of uh, wastewater reuse happening in their urban periphery. Uh, for agriculture and which is largely informal. If we come to the cities which are second-tier, fast-growing secondary cities, again, there is wastewater reuse. 
which is in the urban agriculture and informal. There are some examples of uh, wastewater reuse for uh, filling up the lakes or the water bodies as Pei was discussing with uh, limited success and fewer business models for wastewater reuse in industrial sector, the urban wastewater reuse. So I think a bit of everything in terms of institutions, infrastructure, and uh, information would take us a long way in that. Thank you very much, uh, Mona. Dr. Vera? Yes, so I mean, uh, when you get into Sri Lanka, of course, what we see, actually, the ministry, the water supply board, I'm from the National Water Supply and Drainage Board, and we are struggling to get the real value of water in the country. That's because one way that we are, we were blessing of 200,000 millimeter per annum rainfall, which is fairly good enough for a country. But nowadays, Sri Lanka actually recently it was ranked as the second most impact country from the world, this uh, climate change adverse impacts. So now we are really, really facing this stress situation. So countries put in forward to put up this, um, the, the value for all the products come in with this waterproof print because we need to get the real message of the value of the water because government has really given this water for a very low price so we are in average paying around four US dollars per month it's really really not enough for us to put up the the sense of this water value so that is what we are struggling so we are put when uh, when you get into the western province where uh, right now we are here so the, the government wanted to put up this rainwater harvesting concepts as something mandatory for the policy level, but still struggling when you are getting the ground level. So Sri Lanka, of course, we do not find sewer networks. The centralized system is almost less than 4%. So resource recovery level is something fairly le very low here, but definitely we need to address. When you come into the industry, like hotelians and all, so they have one side because they can't discharge their water. They have to go with something advanced treatment. So then they are in a stress of putting up uh, advanced uh, technologies like membrane technology, probably with nanofiltration, to get something to uh, back into their systems. So we are putting up that concept in the isolated locations, but not in the national level, but definitely in the next decade is for this uh, to get in the way of the uh, three double, uh, triple R concepts, of course. Thank you very much for sharing. Jennifer? Uh, yes, as the introduction mentioned, uh, I'm representing a new organization that's focusing sp specifically on fecal sludge management. So I'm here to talk a little bit about sanitation. All of the other panelists mentioned a lot about water reuse. Um, and <clears throat> I think that, um, as Pei mentioned in his, in his keynote, we really need to move people out of their comfort zone. And if you think that's challenging in water, think about how it is for human waste. And so one of the core mission, one of our key principles for the FSM Alliance is really to shift people's thinking about treating human waste as a valued resource um, and something that can be uh, valued and, and used. And so that's one of the key things that we'll be advocating and focus on. There's a lot of emerging, emerging evidence and research coming out of all the diff different possible ways that you can use human waste as a, as a resource. There are lots of nutrients to be recovered, and there's also a lot of emerging technologies that are being developed that create value products from human waste. So um, we look forward to sharing a lot of this information and, and entering this part of the uh, entering that into the into the mainstream conversation as well. Thank you very much. Okay. protein from the waste without going through the normal value chain of having the cow eating of fertilizing the spot, having the cow eating it, etc. Um, so I think that's all very much interlinked and the same principles apply. Um, Mona, uh, I think the big challenge is definitely comes with the water supply and wastewater reuse both are taken over by the informal sector. And this this tells us how important the work of the work, the work of the World Health Organization and IWA is when they publish the water, the water safety plans, the sanitation safety plans. These are very, very important instruments which we need to approach these sectors in this situation. So I think I see there are a lot of commonalities. Thank you very much for those comments, Kay, and uh, your presentation. 
all of the members of the panel. I would like to thank you for coming out here from different parts of the world, for sharing with the audience your expertise, your wisdom. And I'd like to conclude on a note of uh, a slight provocation for us. About, uh, as I conclude the session, uh, one wonders whether the world is uh, facing a water scarcity challenge or is the world facing a scarcity of good water management approaches. I'll leave that thought with you. Thank you very much for your participation, your attendance, and I trust you'll have a super evening.